Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the latest in the ESIS podcast series. My name is Lisa Christensen, and uh, I am one of the social care leads within the ESIS team. Delighted to be here today to talk about the role of a single coordinator, in which is described in the um, discharge policy that came out last year. And I'm really delighted to have with us Joe Williamson. Hi, Joe. Hi, Lisa. Hi. Do you just want to say what your role is and uh, who you are? Yeah, you sure. Work? So, uh, yeah, Joe Williamson. I am the head of Integrated System Flow in the Swindon locality of BSWCCG. Thank you for having me. It's a real pleasure. Thanks for doing it. We're really grateful. OK, so let's. Um, can you start off by just describing to us a little bit about the system within which you're the single coordinator? Yeah, so BSW CCG is of, it's Bain, Swindon and Wiltshire uh, CCG, uh, so three localities uh, come together as, as one STP. Um, so I um, originally worked in the Wiltshire locality um, as Head of Urgent Care um, under the um, when response to COVID, uh, almost a year ago now, I was asked to go across and support the Swindon locality um, in the response to COVID as they didn't have an urgent care lead. So, so that's, that's how this came about really. Um, and responding to the, to the policy, which is the hospital discharge guidance. So that, that's where it started back in March last year. Brilliant. Thanks very much. So that's really, so now we know where we're talking about. Um, and can you just describe a little bit, um, you know, how many trusts, how many people are involved, you know, how, how many partners are involved in this? Yeah, so, so for BSW, um, there are three uh, acute trusts, um, a, along with community hospitals um, in the Baines and Wiltshire area. For Swindon, we have an intermediate care centre, but we don't have any community hospitals. So one main trust, uh, one local authority, um, with with um, bed, step down beds in in the intermediate care centre, as well as beds in nursing and residential homes. Lovely. Okay, brilliant. So now we, we we've got a, a really great picture. Thanks very much for that. So can you just talk us through how your system went about deciding who should be the single coordinator, and actually went about deciding whether to have one or not? Because not everywhere's actually got there yet. No, they haven't, and I've been contacted by some different areas now that that Swindon, you know, follow, following the um, response to COVID, have really recognised the need for this role. Um, so back, like I say, in March, um, we were following the guidance. Um, the acute trust, our local authority colleagues, our community colleagues, had to identify kind of a senior. Uh, person to lead from their organisations and to be able to respond to to the need of of reducing the the bed base, increasing the bed base in the acute. Sorry, so my role is urgent care, and it was about supporting flow. So I think really I came in from from working from a CCG perspective and not one of the organisations. Mm. It was it was maybe easier for me to come in and support those those working really really hard on the front line um, operationally to to bring all the services together. So I'm seeing it for, through a different lens really. Although I've got you know a nurse hat on, um, and you're always looking at getting the patients into the right place at the right time. For me, being external to social care, to the acute and to the community providers, I was able to see it from a different perspective. So quite early on, it was, it was, it kind of fell about, I think, you know, it was, mm. it wasn't, oh, can we ask Joe to do that? By me being able to and having the capacity time to bring people together to have meetings. And again, we don't want to have meetings for meetings sake, but bringing those partners together to have those discussions and, and it created good discussions. There was challenge. Um, people have different opinions, but at the, the end of the day, we're all there for the same aim. And that's mm. ensuring that, that we get the patients out of hospital, that they're safe, they've got the right care and they're in the right place. So I think quite early on, 
I was able to bring those people together quite quickly um, mm. and, and respond to following the policy, which I think some people found or, or didn't, didn't take that. That was al almost like my Bible because yeah. it gave us the guidance. It, it showed us, you know, where we needed to get to, how we got there. We did that locally, but actually it gave us the guidance on what we needed to do. From what you're saying, I could, I, I'm getting quite a strong picture that, that people might have been quite grateful in the system, that there was somebody who was going to take on that role and help them to understand this new policy because you were just immersed in it. You were fairly senior. Um, so did that make a difference? Do you think your seniority and, and the sort of did, was there immediate acceptance of, of your kind of role? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think what what um, was also what we recognised is that we had some new senior members that had joined the acute trust. We also had some um, social care colleagues who have been in their roles a long time, so well established and understand the system. Um, with me in my previous role working across Bainswindon and Wiltshire, having an oversight of all three, I think the combination of skill that we had mm -hmm. and the knowledge, we were able to that the new guys coming in were really keen to work with us and understand the geography of Swindon um, and the complexities. Um, and then we had the experienced ones that were happy and grateful to have a senior lead to be able to pull it all together um, because yeah. they all had day jobs to do as well. So it was, it was yeah, really well accepted um, and appreciated. So what from from what you're saying that one of the one of the key things and benefits for the system of this role was making sure that people had the opportunity to talk through and to go through possibly a bit of you know challenging and you know arm folding to to uh, uh, to get to work out together how they were going to actually implement the policy is that is have I got that right absolutely yeah yeah, yeah. and we yeah. came together regularly at the start you know it could have been three times a week um, we we all pulled together you do the seven day working because we wanted to make sure that those systems and processes we were putting in place were were seamless and we weren't asking people to duplicate things yeah. so uh, yeah absolutely Oh, well, that's really good. So, so far sounds marvellous, but don't tell me that there weren't a few kind of hiccups on the way. Yeah. So let's have it warts and all, you know, how, yeah. how, how was that? I mean, were, were there any kind of things that you, you would sort of say that people should look out for and um, be prepared for? I have to say, in comparison to how it could have been, it, it went relatively smoothly. Yes, we mm. did have the hiccups, so we had the IT hiccups, we had the, um, what, what really key is consistency. Mm. So senior people I had coming to those calls were the same senior people. Um, so you had the, the same, same people on the call with the same message and, and the communication um, mm. was key. I think it was the message, getting the message out um, and there were different messages uh, in the early days and, and of different um, systems so IT systems different um, communications teams so I think we had a lot of things being communicated at different times um, with different terminology so mm -hmm. I think that may that well that did confuse people um, again, we pulled it all back together. So we we have one group, and we still have that group now of senior leaders, who we bring back to the table um, to say, you know, it's just a, a, again a review of the self assessment against the the policy is having a consistent message, consistent communication, um, and just with simple changes, you know, people will go and verbally say, okay, tomorrow we're going to do this. But actually, we needed to do it as a locality. Mm. So so it took a few times, um, but mm. we do, could keep coming back to the same message. Yes. Um, but I have to say, hiccups, everybody, uh, I couldn't believe, well, it couldn't have worked better. The response from all partners was absolutely amazing. Mm. Um, That's very good to hear. And I, and I think I've heard in, in some in some systems where actually 
previously relationships weren't brilliant and there wasn't very good communication quite a lot of the the, the, the policy is done is to because it's a requirement it's national policy etc it's a must do yeah you know where people have really embraced that they they found it quite liberating um as a as a result yeah so so um what impact do you think it's had and and how do you know what the impact is uh bearing in mind that the issues you've said about you know different data sets and all the rest of it sounds like you were kind of getting to one version of the truth by hook or by crook yeah yeah absolutely so i think um what what's kind of the learning for us going forward is around um the evidence and impact so you know each we prepare for each winter don't we we didn't prepare for covid and we've, yes. we've been able to respond to that so it's about keeping that momentum of those assessments out of hospital mm -hmm. um we, we've seen um by doing following the policy we've seen the lowest number of patients be discharged from an acute setting on pathway three um so he, that was a huge huge um success and we've got the data to to um evidence that mm. so our key focus has been on pathway one um and some of our therapy well our therapy under the peak of covid came out into the community um mm. and i felt we i think we thought that there were going to be some challenges because mm. You know, if you're working in an environment of an acute hospital, you get used to that environment, you get used to the way of working, don't you? But yes. the therapists responded, they come out into the community and now some of them don't want to go back, which is absolutely the way we want to go. Yeah. Um, so so everybody kind of mucked in. We've we've all got you know, they've all got on with it and it's it's made the acute therapy and nursing staff realise the risk that community services hold to keep their patients at home. Mm. And that's that's primary care, you know, that's out of yes. hours, that, that's everyone. So I think it's given them a um, different outlook. Mm. Um, so, so they're actually out there looking at it rather than being in an acute looking out. So yeah, so, so pathway three, minimal number of patients going to a permanent placement from an acute pathway one, we we got to a place where we were referring and discharging on the day oh. um fabulous still a long way to go we're still mm. working to to that model um and we're looking at how we use our step down beds um rather so pathway one directly home and mm. stepping up into a bed if we need it rather mm. than stepping down from an acute into a bed so you know less transfers before the patient gets home let's get yeah. them home and then do that assessment if it's not safe then step them up but again shifting the bed based model to the pathway one home with wraparound care is what is it's given us the, the data and the evidence to suggest that's in the best interest of the patient so I'm interested um, uh, in that this has all been around the Swindon bit of the patch. What about the other bits of your patch? Are they are they kind of starting to think? Mm. <laughs> so they yes, absolutely. So mm. so what Baines and um, Wiltshire have done is they have recruited an, an integrated patient flow lead. Mm -hmm. So has a similar role um, to what I'm doing, not the full single coordinator role though. Um, again, like I say. Our local authority, acute and Swindon locality, seen the benefit of yeah. me coming into that role. So they've had it through COVID and seen it and seen the benefits. Um, and, and I think, you know, the other two localities are now looking to see the benefit. Oh, Wiltshire also yeah. is, um, they face all three trusts within our STP so they have patients in all three acute so mm. the demand on their services is quite high so um, yes they work slightly differently um, yes. and I would would say um, having been with Swindon now a year they are pretty unique um, mm. and, mm -hmm. and yeah the, the response to the services is is immense but it's um uh, it's interesting actually and it's quite helpful to, to sort of think about that because um, what we've found, the, 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 the policy description of the single coordinator role um, implies really that you'd have one per system, it does, but it's not specific about it. But I, I, I hear from you that probably that is the best 
thing to do. So, uh, to, so to have one for for each acute kind of system. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. You can then focus on the the system. Yeah. Um, it's not to say so I you know I work under the Swindon locality but we still have out of area patients so I've still got that relationship with Gloucestershire uh, mm. Oxfordshire Berkshire and Be Wiltshire as well you know a, a percentage of their patients are in Great Western Hospital mm. um, so I've still got that kind of matrix working yes. Um, yes. within the role so I, I'm not just fixed on Swindon residents it's anybody mm. that needs support to be discharged from that acute setting as well yeah so i think if you looked at a single coordinator over the three acutes that would be kind of a helicopter view because mm. you wouldn't be able to sustain um the the level of work that's kind of happening yeah. to to, yeah. to keep that keep that going really yeah yeah so it's a great mixture isn't it between bit strategic but actually getting stuck in to sort out some of the problems and helping yeah. people to and making it sustainable yeah. yeah 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 so you're going to be carrying on Jo. so um yeah so the update is so mm -hmm. the, the the role um became fixed until the end of march um with the swindon borough council and the ccg absolutely saying yes we need to keep this in until the end of march um they've now reviewed the role and the jobs description as with other areas that are bringing the role in, and they are making it uh, substantive, a substantive post, they can see the benefits, absolutely. That is great. That's great. I think we should probably wrap up right on that. <laughs> Positive note. Yeah. Is there anything else that you, you, you know, I mean, I, I'm imagining that you would encourage other people to, to, to try to go for this approach? Absolutely. And I have to say, I have been contacted by um, some colleagues in, in the north um, and south about the role um, mm. and how, how we've worked it and what it's like. And, you know, does it have to be a registered clinician? What what sort of person does it need to be? So I have been contacted via ESIS and NHSEI um, from, from some colleagues who are obviously looking at the role. But I think it's probably one of the best things we've done and actually like you say for me I've got that strategic overview but operationally yeah I've got a, a, a nice balance yeah fantastic Jo thank you so much for sharing all of that with us and I think uh, I mean we are naughty we do we do point people in your direction but hopefully <laughs> there will be increasing numbers um, throughout the country as people realize the strength of it uh, uh, as a role um, that really helps people to uh, to deliver what we all want to deliver. So thank you so much. You've explained it so clearly for us. My pleasure. Thank you, Lisa.